Welcome into the Hoffman Show. That's a podcast where we go a little bit deeper and wider than we can on the radio because, well, that's a podcast. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Joseph Yuzinski. His first book, The People's News, Media, Politics, and the Demands of Capitalism, addresses how audience demand, dr- audience demand drives news content. And then his second book is American Conspiracy Theories, which examines why people believe in conspiracy theories. And with Kyrie Irving in the news for being Kyrie Irving this week, I wanted to talk to someone who could help explain to me uh, how Kyrie maybe is susceptible to some of these things and why so many others. And there's obviously other stories prevalent right now in pop culture uh, that are similar and also what we should do about it as a media to handle it as consumers of, of what these folks do, whether it's Kanye West, Kyrie Irving, etc. So with that long introduction, Dr. Yuzinski, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for your time. So on a very broad level, as I just said, you've, you wrote a book about this, so people should go read it if they want the uh, book-length version. But on a broad level, why do people believe in conspiracy theories? For the same reasons they believe everything else, right? There really isn't any difference between why people adopt conspiracy theories versus why they adopt other ideas. People are always trying to find out how the world works and why. People are trying to understand the things that are going on around them. And sometimes they'll land on a conspiracy theory and sometimes they'll land on some other explanation. Um, So that might be an unsatisfying answer, but it's probably the truest answer, right? We all believe conspiracy theories. You know, what, what my survey research tells us is that Everybody buys into one, if not a few. Um, Some people buy into many, many, many conspiracy theories. And what we might say about those people is that they have a worldview in which conspiracy theories are the more likely explanation of things rather than some other form of explanation, right? Just like a religious person might look out the window and say, oh, well, God did this, and God did that, and that's demons, or that's the devil doing things, right? That's one way of viewing the world, which leads you to a certain set of explanations. And there's a conspiratorial worldview, which is people who you already don't like are, are, are working behind the scenes to engineer things that you don't like, right? So someone looks out the window with that worldview, and they're going to see all sorts of conspiracies going on everywhere, even on short evidence, right? But we all have worldviews. We just all have different ones. And essentially what we do is when information comes in all day long and we have to process it, that information gets processed through those worldviews. So two people can look at the exact same thing and one person will say, oh, okay, That's whatever. And another person will say, oh, that must be a conspiracy going on behind it. Right. So it's not it's not as if people who buy into a conspiracy theory were dropped on their head as a kid or have some sort of necessarily a mental illness or or anything like that, even though that could be the case. Um, It's just people people come to beliefs um, through different methods. So. That actually is where I wanted to go next, which is I think people will be surprised that the kinds of and really I say the kinds of people, the wide variety of people that can be drawn to conspiracy theories. Someone like Kyrie Irving spent a year at Duke, one of the best universities in the country. Um, He is someone who has access to all kinds of information thanks to his sphere of influence and and the, the circles in which he runs. Uh, in professional basketball and, and as a global athlete for Nike. Um, are there common threads, though, amongst folks who tend to go down these rabbit holes and believe in conspiracy theories, whether it's one or whether it's many? Well, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that simply having access to information doesn't mean that you're going to access it. <laughs> Clearly. Right. And even if you're told flat out, you know, here's the right information and here's good evidence for why you should believe it doesn't mean you're going to believe it. People disagree about all sorts of things. And sometimes they're right. and Sometimes they're wrong. So, I mean, I'd like to say, oh, gosh, if only, you know, we got rid of the wrong information from the Internet or if only we had more right information, everything would change. But uh, people tend to believe things that match what they already believe. They believe things that match their worldviews and their personal identities. So it's just not the case that if you went up to Kyrie Irving or anyone else 
and told them the right thing, that they'd be, oh, thanks, and then just change their mind <laughs> to be in line with the information you gave them. That's, that's not how people work, right? So even just putting that aside, I mean, yes, you know, people who tend to believe lots of conspiracy theories generally have this underlying worldview in which lots of things are controlled by conspiracies, usually by groups that they already dislike. So that's sort of in common. And then once you uh, go beyond that, you tend to find, and this is going to be different in Kyrie's case, because obviously he's a very wealthy basketball player, very well-to-do. Um, but the people who tend to have these worldviews tend to be less educated. They tend to make less money. Um, and they tend to have other psychological traits. Um, now, again, those are averages across the population. That's not indicative of every single person who believes any conspiracy theory, right? Um, but typically, the people who are really into conspiracy theories, I mean, they, they are different in some ways than, than the people who don't. Because of what you just said, what is the impact of someone like a Kyrie Irving, someone like a Kanye West, high profile people? And we can obviously think of others if we want to enter the political spectrum. Uh, but it, it, how do we like what kind of impact does that have when someone with power, someone with access, someone with education gives credence to anti-Semitism, to any of the other number of things that have come up in recent weeks around high profile people uh, giving credence to conspiracy theories? Well, whether it convinces anyone or not, it's I generally think of that sort of stuff as bad um, because I would prefer to have an, an information ecosystem that is more true stuff than false stuff, or at least unsupported stuff. I would prefer to have people acting on beliefs that are closely tethered to the truth rather than not. Um, but with that said, I'm not convinced that you know, just as I, I just said a moment ago, people don't always change their minds just because they hear something, right? So it's not like you're going to put a, a Republican and a Democrat, lock them in a closet for a minute and have them change the other one's mind, or a Jew and a Catholic, and they're going to change the other one's mind just through a conversation or two. People aren't that amenable to being persuaded, particularly when it's an idea that they care about or have strong feelings about in some way. So just because a famous basketball player comes out and says, hey, you know, this, that, and the other thing, it doesn't mean that anyone's going to change their mind because of it. And generally, I assume that people won't change their minds, right? Now, what might look like influence is largely something like this, where, where somebody who has a large following comes out and says something, and the people who are already inclined to that idea are going to buy into it. And, and that's going to make sense for someone like Kyrie or, or other people who, who espouse conspiracy theories because their audiences are already being attracted to them because those people share conspiracy theories and those audiences are already into conspiracy theories. So what, look, what might look like somebody influencing the masses is really just them coming together on ideas that they've already shared. Um, so... Yeah, so it's more empowerment than it is. And we've seen that, for instance, you know, groups being more vocal, anti Semitic groups being more vocal in the, in light of Kanye's comments, where it's like it gave them a permission structure versus actually creating new converts. Yeah, those guys didn't become Nazis last week, right? <laughs> they were Nazis for a long time. So it's not like they went out and got those Hitler tattoos the day after they heard Kanye's comments. I mean, they had that stuff for a long time. So, all Kanye is doing is just telling them what they already believe. So he's not really persuading them. He might be emboldening them or giving them something to be excited about, but he's, he, it's probably not the case that he's changing their mind in any, in any meaningful way or influencing them. Um, because in a lot of ways, Kanye is probably the last person who would influence those folks, if you think about it. Right. And it's only because he's saying what they want to hear that, they, that they're all of a sudden Kanye fans. Right. Uh, my good friend Jane Koston uh, from the New York Times tweeted something yesterday that was great, where she's like, if you if, if what Kanye or Kyrie is saying is convincing you that Adolf Hitler loved black people, you don't really know that much about Hitler. Uh, of course, the purveyor of the Aryan race. Um, when you 
I, I, I just got done right before we were taping, watching the back and forth with Kyrie the other night in his press conference and Nick Friedel, reporter uh, from ESPN, and Kyrie just really not making any sense. Um, and and it, it makes me think of like, what are we supposed to do with this? Because it feels like can, letting it go is not a viable option. It feels like challenging it in many ways is futile because as you talked about, like the, you're not really going to be able to change minds. It often reinforces, especially when it's often seen, like the media is often seen as the enemy of so many conspiracy theories. So what what is the proper response uh, I would say both on an interpersonal level, if you like someone has a family member that maybe believes in a conspiracy theory, but, but in terms of Kyrie, like what do you do in a public sphere with someone like that who is sharing dangerous views and espousing misinformation when the natural inclination for say a reporter uh, like myself or like Nick is to challenge that information. So there's not a good answer for this. And that's what I found. That's why I had you on, Doc. That's what That's what I was... Okay, fine. Let me have it. Thing. I mean, when this became a real issue where conspiracy theories really sort of blew up, let's say 2016, largely because of Trump and some others, but largely because of Trump, um, Trump came out and it, at the point where it looked like he had the Republican nomination for president wrapped up in the summer of 2016. And he came out and said that Ted Cruz's dad probably took part in the Kennedy assassination in 1963. Ludicrous, right? And the Washington Post had a really good headline that they put out, say, how are we supposed to cover this? They didn't know. And I don't blame them for not knowing, because normally, you know, we have a history, at least in the last several decades, that you that mainstream presidential candidates and, and party nominees are espousing made up conspiracy theories about their political competitors. Certainly not in you know, in this range where they're so <laughs> so ridiculous, like Ted Cruz's dad killed Kennedy. Um there's not a good answer for it, right? On the one hand, we shouldn't be afraid that just because somebody says a conspiracy theory that everyone's all of a sudden gonna buy into it. You know, we gotta put that thinking out the window because it's just not true. Um, I've been tracking numerous conspiracy theories over time with, with polling, and what we find is the vast majority are fairly stable in terms of how many people believe them over time, right? So a handful go up over time, but most are either staying the same or decreasing in the amount of support that they have over time. So that's sort of good and reassuring news. Right. So even if if Kyrie or anyone else is saying whatever they want, it doesn't mean that it's going to be changing, changing everybody else's views. Now, with that said, I, I, I think that what I would recommend to journalists at this point is if you are covering someone who's espousing conspiracy theories, make sure that they are not just calling them conspiracy theories, um, but making sure that you're saying that, you know, what the evidence in their favor is and what the evidence against them is. And usually there's almost no evidence in the favor and a lot of evidence against them, but just to be very clear about that. So it's like so-and-so celebrity said this conspiracy theory, but, you know, here are all the organizations and experts that say there's just simply no evidence for this, right? So I think that's a good way just to contextualize it so people know um, what's going on. Um, but... It's not like there's any magic word or phrase you could say to Kyrie or any other conspiracy believer that's going to change their mind, right? Right. This, I mean, this if, is the... if, if I have a family member or, or or someone like that who believes in a conspiracy theory and they share it with me, I usually say, "Well, where did you where did you hear about that?" From? And at least it gets them to confront the sources, right? Mm. So if they say, "Oh, I got it in the New York Times today," okay, then. You know, but if they say I got it from conservativeeaglenewspunch.com, dot com, then it's like okay, and at least they have to say it out loud, so they're thinking about, you know, the idea that sources matter, and maybe maybe they should attach um, their belief to the credibility of whatever source they're getting it from. Right. Well, I mean, this is the hard part about Kyrie specifically um, is he is someone who believes in secret societies. 
and that there are like these circles of power that the rest of us don't know. And, you know, every time the media pushes back against him, he's actually, it's actually because he's getting one step closer to this truth that no one, that, that, that he is so close to uncovering, but no one else could possibly know about. And I, that is, I guess the, and the struggle is like, you're, you're trying to fight back with the institution that he already says is a front or is, is like a facade basically for some other secretive something. Well, that's the neat thing about conspiracy theories, right? Neat's an interesting that, word. <laughs> yeah. They're sort of unfalsifiable. And by that, I mean, you right. can't really prove them wrong. I mean, my favorite example is, is birtherism. Mm -hmm. So when Barack Obama came to power uh, in 2008, People said, uh, oh, he doesn't have a birth certificate, so he must have been born somewhere else outside the U.S. And then Obama brought out his short-form birth certificate. And they said, well, he doesn't have a long-form birth certificate, so it must mean that he was born somewhere else. Then he came out with the long-form birth certificate. And they said, well, that, that long-form birth certificate is obviously a forgery, so he must have been born somewhere else. So there isn't any evidence that anyone could put forward that was going to change these folks' mind because they could keep moving the goalposts. Mm -hmm. further and further back, so they could never be proven wrong. But that's sort of baked into what conspiracy theories are. I mean, the allegation is that you have powerful people working in secret, uh, doing bad things, and covering up those activities, right? So the expectation right off the bat is that um, you're not going to find any evidence in favor of the plot because it's being hidden by the conspirators. That's the point. And of course you're going to have a bunch of evidence against the conspiracy because the conspirators are throwing out red herrings. And that's exactly what's, you know, what you're describing here. Well, of course they say I'm wrong. That's what you would expect them to do, right? And of course that's what we'd expect them to do if they existed and if they were actually doing it, right? Right. So that's sort of that's sort of the weird thing. It's not like a factual claim um, where you can sort of you know gather evidence and then show that a that a factual claim is either false or factual. Here, with a conspiracy theory, you can't necessarily prove it false because there's the assumption that you're just not going to have evidence for it, and all the evidence would be pointing the other direction. But that's you can always expand your conspiracy theory to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, now the media's in on it. And now the UN's in on it. And now all these other people are in on it. So, of course, they say I'm wrong because they're all in on it. So I have gone back and forth between, like, two different ways to handle this as I've been thinking about what I want to say about it, uh, about Kyrie. I'm, you know, my job is to have takes and such. But I, I truly do, like, I'm a, I'm a, Jewish person, like this bothers me, um, on a personal level. And, you know, many other things that many other people have said have bothered me about, you know, non-Jewish people and, you know, black folks or LGBTQ folks, whatever. I I've certainly given takes on all kinds of, uh, ways in which society has punched down, uh, on this show since I've been doing it. And, and over the years of, of doing these types of shows, um, and on one hand, I think empathy can sometimes cut through. Um, and on, on the other hand, I also think sometimes mockery can, can cut through, um, where you, you know, you have this group of people that thinks that they're all knowing and knowledgeable and strong. And it's like, actually you're kind of a clown, but I also think other times it's worth it to look at someone like Kyrie Irving and go, I have empathy for you. Why don't you have empathy for me? Uh, what do you make of those two approaches that have, have both been tried, um, you know, inside and outside the political world and, and sports and in all facets of life where these things wind up coming up? Um, both can work, right? And there, there are published studies that have done this. I mean, there, there are a lot of people in my line of work who are uh, trying to develop methods for changing people's minds about various conspiracy theories. And ridicule can work, right, on some people. Um, so can empathy. Saying, I share your concerns about the pandemic and the vaccines and all these things that are happening are very scary and you know, I, I share that with you and I understand why, you know, why you're concerned about it. That can, you know, that, that can certainly at least share with somebody who's believing something um, that, that you empathize with them and that you understand their fears and that you're not making light of it, right? And then maybe from that point you can have a more fruitful conversation. But let me, 
you know, your listeners could try something. Thanksgiving's coming up. so Oh, boy, here we go. So why don't we encourage everyone to go do this? When you're at the dinner table, after a few bottles of wine have gone down, and you will guarantee to have an <laughs> uncle or an aunt, you know, who is espousing some conspiracy theory or another, uh, try the ridicule or empathy approach and see if it works. <laughs> there we and go. You that, get invited back the next year. Yeah, it's, well, the, hey, so it's the official like, Hoffman Show that study. Uh, that is still what happened. <laughs> do, we, do I get to be co-author on that with you? And we, yeah. we collect the evidence, and then I get to be a published author in an academic thing? That seems like a odd twist this show never was going to take otherwise um all right I, here's my last question for you i don't um, get invited back to thanksgiving anymore just so you know. i mean hey look if you don't change their mind maybe that's not the worst thing you know <laughs> um my last question for you is this uh adam silver commissioner of the nba calls you and says joe what do i do uh, or you know the president of nike calls you and goes should we should we drop him like obviously adidas just dropped yay um, you know, what, what would you be your advice if you're someone like the NBA, like the Brooklyn Nets, like Nike, who's associated with Kyrie Irving right now? So I, I think for the private companies that are selling products, I mean, it's completely up to them in the sense, do they want this person and whatever baggage they bring with them representing their product? I mean, that's, you know, so companies don't have to really be, um, consistent, I guess. They could just look at any person and say, well, this is going to help us or hurt us, and then they can keep the person on or not. With the, with the league, I think it's a different issue because it's a, it's a job, right? And I, I think the issue then is, yeah, on the one hand, you don't want people saying things that are completely incendiary and then be paying them and then sort of damaging the reputation of the league. On the other hand, you got to be a little bit consistent with it, right? Because are we only going to fire people for certain conspiracy theories? Right. Well, what about all conspiracy theories? If I say that I think COVID's a, 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 a conspiracy, does that get me fired? But what if I say that Trump conspired with Russia to rig the 2016 election? Does that get me fired too? Right? So once you go down this road of saying we're going to fire people for conspiracy theories or take some action against them, you open up this whole can of worms because there's so many conspiracy theories out there and nobody really wants to be even handed. Well, and also who's the arbiter of which one's conspiracy and which one's true. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's no great way to do that. First of all. And once you start unpacking this box, you find there's tons of conspiracy theories out there, many of which wind up in the mainstream news. So if you pre repeat some, something that came out of the New York times, does that get you fired just because it is sort of conspiratorial? And then why just conspiracy theories? I mean, it's, it's why shouldn't we fire people for religion, too, if you want to go down that road? I mean, not all, I mean, not all religions can be true, right? Because they all make contradictory claims from each other. Like this one says, I have the true God, and the other group says, no, our God is different, and that's the true God. Well, they can't all be right. Do we start firing them? Right. Religious well, religion? I guess I guess yeah. to play, you know, that's that's really fascinating. And I appreciate that perspective. Um, I guess the, the pushback would be if if your beliefs uh, hurt people, um, whether it's like mentally, emotionally or potentially, you know, anti-Semitism leads to violence. Um, and we've seen that time sure. and time again. And like, is that, that is that the line? Conspiracy theories, too. Yeah, they could be coming from all sorts of places. Right. So so then the question becomes, well, is it going to be the effect of what the person says or just the substance of what they say? Because um, it, uh, it opens up a whole lot of things. And, and it, I'm not saying that you, we shouldn't examine these questions or that there's right. no solution. I'm just saying the solutions are aren't always as obvious as they seem. Yeah. And I guess it would also, you know, the, the follow up would be like, what's the sociological impact of like, let's say Nike drops. Kyrie Irving in the same way that Adidas dropped yay like it obviously diminishes their platform it diminishes their standing um and and by shrinking that is there some tangible effect that could have a positive outcome um on on the larger society and that's that's kind of I guess the the gist of the question as well we don't know right I mean I uh, you know seldom do I deal with with questions of uh Nike endorsements and things like that <laughs> Because I'm not in the sports world, I'm, I'm right. I study, you know, more people who aren't superstars and what they do. And, and if I am looking at people who are popular, it's usually politicians, right? So, mm. 
Um, I can't tell you what, what, what Nike should do or what effect their, their sponsorships have on public opinion writ large. I imagine a lot of the people who buy the sneakers probably buy them because they like the sneakers and maybe the performance of the person on the court. Um, and maybe aren't familiar with everything the person says. And even if they are, they might not believe it all. But if Nike wanted to find another person to sponsor, I'm sure they could. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, this was really, really interesting. Great food for thought. I'm glad we had the conversation. Dr. Joseph Yazinski, if you want more, again, the books are The People's News, Media, Politics, and the Demands of Capitalism and Americans' Conspiracy Theories. He's also been also been featured in articles in Rolling Stone, the Washington Post. Uh, you just you just search his name and you can you can find a lot more great knowledge and data. Or enroll at the University of Miami and take his class. Uh, Doc, thank you so much for uh, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.